All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, we've got a pretty small crew here. Um, I think something about the weather is probably <laughs> causing us to have a few uh, a few no shows today. Um, but uh, uh, I'm Craig Jonkis. Uh, my colleague Jesse was just chatting with me. We're both from Penobscot Financial Advisors. Um, uh, we're just a local main firm out of Portland and Bangor. Um, pretty small crew, and we're here today to talk to you a little bit about financial foundations. Um, I think with such a small crowd, I really just want to encourage everyone to be, you know, a participant and proactive about asking their questions if they have them. As I go through the presentation today, feel free to just kind of stop me and ask questions. Um, you know, I think we we cater this stuff to a pretty a broad audience, but where there's only a few of you, if you have some really specific questions that are important to you, I want to spend our time today answering those. So please don't hesitate to um, jump in. But let's see, I'm going to share my screen and get a presentation going. Um, and start here. Let's see. Jesse, does it look right that I'm sharing the full presentation now? Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, we're going to talk about financial foundations today. Um, sometimes talking about this can feel a little bit boring. Um, you know, it's not overly complex, but uh, it's the most important stuff you can do for your long term financial health, you know, getting a a good base down is what sets you up for success over the long run. Um, so it makes sense to spend time there and focus our energy there. Um, so what is a strong foundation? Um, you know, it's having some money in the bank, um, having, you know, freedom from kind of the pressures of debt and how that can make you feel day to day managing your finances. Um, it's uh, you know paying bills on time and not getting getting behind and letting debt accrue, um, and making sure you feel comfortable that you can pay all of your bills. Um, and it almost always involves credit use. You know we're, we like freedom from debt, but most people use some sort of um, credit over their, their lifetime. It can be a really really valuable tool, but we want to do it responsibly, right, and not get into trouble with it. So I'm going to touch on all of these topics a little bit today. And as well, at the end, I'm going to touch a little bit on, um, you know, just some basics of investing as well. So once you get a foundation down, you know, what your next steps might look like. So let's start on just the real basics of, of cash management here. Just, you know, getting an account, um, you know, some, for some people just, you know, getting that started is, um, is the hurdle. And um, so what do you need to open an account? Um First, just a government issued ID, um, you know, bring in your personal basic identifying information like your social security number, your date of birth. And, you know, of course, you're going to need some cash to make an initial deposit to open an account. Um, and I don't think we have any minors in here today, but if you are a minor, you're going to need to have a co-owner who is, um, you know, over 18 to sign uh, for you. So not a... Um, not a, a very difficult process to you know get a bank account, but a necessary first step that gets you set on kind of the path to success and having a foundation, um, you know, and, and uh, having money in the bank gets you FDIC insurance, um, allows you to use some of the tools that I'm going to talk about um, here uh, later on too. Um, but then, you know, what kind of accounts do you need? So, you know, we always hear these checking and savings. And if anyone's ever watched Kevin Hart, he has a really great check and versus check savings. And savings. Yeah. And, uh, every time every I want to slide, I think about it. it. Worth a watch, but, but um, you know, yeah, not, yeah, the, not applying here to it here. Um, you know, the basics of, you know, what you need is important. Um, what do we use a checking account for? I like to think of checking account as, you know, just your basic operational account. Um, so you're going to pay your bills out of your checking account, um, you know, write checks to uh, people to pay those bills out of your checking account. 
usually you have a debit card associated with it so you, that you're going to slide to make your purchases. Um, this is kind of your everyday account. You're going to buy your groceries. You know, you're going to keep the lights on and you're going to, you know, have your fund spending, um, you know, all kind of come right out of that checking account, right? Um, anything you're doing day to day, week to week, month to month, usually comes out of this operational bucket. Um, so pretty much everyone, when they get started, that's their first kind of account is, is the checking and it serves as operations. Um, you know, what to look for when you have a checking account. There's really no reason to have to have an account with monthly fees anymore these days. There's plenty of banks who offer checking accounts without monthly fees. So if you are paying fees, really, I recommend kind of searching around and looking for a bank that doesn't. I know, you know, locally, Bangor Savings Bank is a great bank that doesn't charge fees. Um, looking for low or no overdraft fees, especially if you're tight on the finances, and that can be a little bit of a habit that you get into, um, you know, making sure those fees are um, competitive or low or non-existent would be ideal. Uh, and then, you know, convenient free ATM access. So Bangor Savings, again, is a bank where they reimburse all your ATM fees, no matter where you go to the ATM. Those little things are important. So um, make sure you check out the banks and, you know, what they're offering for fees and perks. Um, but you're going to be using this a lot, just making sure that your use of this account doesn't um, cause you to pay too many fees. Um, and then savings. So I think, you know, savings is necessary for everybody at some point too, once you get some of the kind of healthy habits down. Um, but savings isn't really your operation account. Savings is just that, something you're looking to put away and build for some specific goal that occurs down the road, right? And there's no real perfect rule of thumb for how long, you know, how far away that goal might need to be for you to suck money in savings. It probably is a different number for everybody. But I tend to say, you know, anything like six months to a year off that you're looking to save for um, could be a good reason to be using a savings account. Also a really good place to build an emergency fund, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more too. Um, so what to look for in a savings account? Um, once again, fees, always important. You know, really no reason to have to have a savings account that is charging you a fee these days. Um, you should be able to get away with it with no fees. Uh, and then, you know, you're really looking for that interest rate. Ideally, this is an account where money goes in and it sits there for a period of time. And if it's going to sit there for a period of time, hopefully they're paying you a pretty good interest rate. Now, you know, interest rates for you know, decade plus up until now kind of stunk, but interest rates are actually pretty good today. Um, so definitely something to shop around for. This slide says a half a percent or higher. Um, that is actually outdated slide in today's age. And we'll talk about it in a second you can get a savings account paying three to 4% um, with relative ease. So just make sure you're shopping those interest rates because you want to make sure your money is working for you. Um, but really good place to build your emergency fund, have some rainy day funds and put away money for specific goals. So speaking of emergency funds and savings accounts, um, you know, what is a healthy emergency fund? We, uh, you know, as financial advisors, we typically say you want to have three to six months worth of your household expenses in an emergency savings account. That can be a really lofty goal. So the big thing is to start somewhere. There's no, you know, kind of minimum amount you need to feel like you put away into an emergency fund to get that you know, rocket and roll it. And having some emergency fund is better than no emergency fund. That three to six month mark is just something you might have if you're establishing a goal for yourself. And it can be a short, medium, or long-term goal to establish your complete emergency fund. Um, but some rules with emergency funds that I like. So I've got on the slide here, online high yield. Um, I like it when people have their emergency funds sufficiently separated from their day-to-day -day operational account. So a lot of times that's kind of having, you know, you're checking your savings account and the savings is the emergency fund. But when they're at the same bank and they're linked together, it can just be so easy to 
quickly make a transfer and spend that emergency fund. And maybe it's on something that's not, you know, actual emergency purposes. Maybe it's a want rather than a need. So these online high yield bank accounts exist in the world. And you can Google this, by the way, and there are probably 30, 40, maybe 50 different online high yield bank accounts. And how these work is they are online only banks. There are no brick or mortar locations for these banks. And because of that, they save on overhead costs and they credit better interest rates. And the way the bank account works, is it links to your um, basic checking account. So let's say you have a checking account at Bangor Savings. You could start an account at SoFi, open a savings account with them. It would link to your Bangor Savings account and you can just transfer money back and forth. But since it's going to a different institution, bank transfers do take about three days usually. So you need to plan ahead. So it limits kind of that, um, you know, function sometimes where you can just instantly transfer money and go use it. It separates the emergency savings from your, you know, core banking accounts. And the other nice thing is it earns great rates. I think I took this snapshot a couple of weeks ago when I was updating these slides and, um, you know, a SoFi. Whoops, I went backwards. A SoFi um, online high yield account is paying a 3.75% interest rate on your cash. No minimum balance, uh, no fees. Uh, they're just really awesome tools to use to start your emergency fund. Um, and there's no really like one bank that we like better than any other. It's about the pl online platform and what you can use really easily what's giving you a decent interest rate. The interest rates do fluctuate, um, but it's a really good place to suck um, emergency funds aside and other purposes too, which we'll talk about later. Um, so once you've kind of got your banking, you know, um, foundation set up, you know, you've got your checking, maybe an online high yield savings account. Um, then it's about starting to develop healthy habits, right? Um, and the first thing that I think people, you know, go to when they're trying to establish foundations is kind of their budget or managing their spending. And I get questions a lot about like, what's the best way to budget or manage my spending? And there's really no one size fits all. I find that personal finance is just that it's very personal and there are things that motivate each individual differently, structure that works for some people, but not others. And the key to managing spending is really um, identifying goals and trying some methods and finding something that works for you and motivates you. On the screen here, I have a few examples I'll just quickly touch on. Um, in today's day and age, there are some great apps that help you um, manage your spending and they don't have to cost money. Some of these apps are free. Uh, Good Budget and Mint have free versions, which I've listed here, but you can Google free budgeting apps and you'd get a whole list of them, I think. Um, so using technology that might automatically kind of screen scrape your bank account, organize where your money is going and help you be aware of where your spending is going um, could be a good start. Um, the envelope method, it was originally kind of old school, uh, but you can apply some kind of new school methodology to it, I think. Um, envelope method is just what it sounds like. It's, um, you know, kind of taking your paycheck and literally putting um, money from each paycheck into a different envelope that's meant for a different set of spending. So you might have utilities and you know it's going to cost you, you know, $150 a month. And you take your paycheck, stuff that envelope with $150. Groceries, maybe it's $400 a month, have a grocery envelope, stuff it with $400. And then you use those envelopes only for those purposes and leftover money can be spent on a discretionary basis. So you kind of stuff each envelope with your needs and only use it for that purpose. And the only money you have left to spend on a discretionary basis is whatever remains after stuffing your envelopes each paycheck. Um, that kind of jives with like a save first, spend what remains structure too, just kind of on the flip. 
Um, you know, save first, spend what remains is just kind of a discipline to identify, you know, like, what are your goals? What do you want to spend money on in the short, medium, long term? And kind of automate every paycheck, a certain amount of savings to those goals. And then don't worry too much about the needs spending, just adjust your lifestyle to spend whatever remains after those discipline savings programs. So the envelope method and the save method are just kind of flip-flop versions of each other. Um, finally, 50, 30, 20 is one people subscribe to that 50% of your money should be spent on needs, 30% on wants, and 20% of your income should be savings. Um, you know, that's a heck of a rule of thumb and rule of thumbs don't apply to everybody. So I get why this doesn't always work. Um, you know, sometimes people's needs make up more than 50% of their income. What are they supposed to do then? So um, I think it's a good goal for people. Um, it gives you some framework if framework works for you, um, you know, but doesn't work for everybody. Uh, and a zero-based budget is um, something that gives every dollar a job, basically. It says, you know, you should get really detailed with your budgeting, uh, write down your income, and then every single dollar of that income should be assigned a job so that at the end of each paycheck cycle, um, what's left is equal to zero. And um, that one, very time intensive, good for very detail oriented people, um, but a whole lot of work too to give every dollar a job. And some of the budgeting apps that are out there will actually um, you know, work with you to do a zero based budget and make sure you assign every dollar a job. Anyways, I'm rambling a bit, a lot of ways to do it. I think the key here is take a step to try something to develop structure and, and do something that feels good, like it will work for you and motivate you. Um, you know, and then I guess I have a slide here on, you know, what is my favorite over years of seeing people manage their personal finances I feel like I have a little bit of a theme in terms of the people that tend to be um, maybe the most uh, kind of in control of their personal finances that feel financially healthy and have peace of mind about their finances. And it ends up being a little bit of a hybrid approach. Um, and that approach is definitely a safe first mentality. Um, people who make a discipline that the first thing they're gonna do with each paycheck is sock something aside and then spend what remains. I find that that method um, doesn't create a lot of stress over the budgeting process, where if you know you're saving enough to accomplish certain goals, and then you can just have the comfort to spend what remains, um, it can just create a good um, you know, feeling of confidence. But then it's got to happen in an automated fashion. And so the automated fashion I'm talking about is like a, a bucketing or envelope approach. So this is actually a screenshot from an online high yield bank, actually, um, that I have on the screen where somebody created, okay, I've got one account at Ally, that's my emergency fund. I've got one account at Ally, that is my home funding goal. Got another one at Ally that is my vacations budget. So that kind of envelopes method or buckets creating very specific goals, tagging them with that title, and then giving yourself like a total goal milestone and saying, I'm going to put $10 a paycheck to this or $100 a paycheck to this. And that's the first thing I'm going to do. Um, just works really, really well. So I think. It's kind of a combination of earmarking goals, saving first, and um, I think just can can really, uh, really work. Um, keys to success in all this, though, is is taking the baby steps to actually, you know, have some goals. It, if you're in a, you know, kind of a paycheck to paycheck situation or if you're, you know, already kind of a little overwhelmed with debt, just um, that first step of starting to think about this and write down your goals and how um, you know you want to change your personal financial management. Uh, that's just such a 
big hurdle to get over. So just starting to do that and write down your goals can be, you know, a real key to success and just starting to develop some healthy habits. So write down those goals, identify large expenses. Um, everybody's got them, you know, write those down too. So make a little calendar of like, you know, what are your expenses? When are they due? Um, how might my goals over the longer run fit into this? And then, you know, expect the unexpected as you go along. Uh, even if you build a plan, you know, uh, uh, nothing goes exactly to plan in any aspects of our life. Finance is no exception. Um, you know, make sure you have an emergency fund. Make sure that is one of your goals and starting to fund that on a regular basis because that's the only way you're going to be able to deal with the unexpected and not have to accumulate more, you know, credit card debt as you go along. And then finally, my last point here, and it's an all bold automation. Um, just if you're, you know, if you're going to start taking some baby steps to be more financially healthy, no matter what your method is, in, in, in today's world, you should be able to automate savings, automate payments. Don't leave it up to your own memory or time management to perform savings or debt reduction or whatever your goal is going to be. Uh, just set it up to happen automatically. Uh, if you can do that, um, you know, I find most people adjust to the situation they put themselves in through automation. Um, all right, so I'm going to transition a little bit to credit management. Before I move on to that, though, I'm just going to stop. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts or anything at all from the cash management section that I just went through? All right, cool. I'm going to keep cranking, but feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. So credit. Um, everyone's going to use credit at some point in their life, um, you know, whether it's buying a home or, you know, doing routine spending for, you know, groceries and the things you want and need, whether it's a car or, you know, anything else, credit is really important, um, important stuff. So first of all, just what's in a credit score number. So everyone gets a credit score um, that kind of identifies risk level of, um, you know, lending with them. Um, you know, what is good credit? What is bad credit? Uh, so you see the tiers here on the screen, you know, 800 to 850 is kind of excellent top-notch credit. That means you're going to start to qualify for, you know, really favorable rates on, you know, things like home loans and car loans and things of that nature. Um, 740 to 799, still a very good credit score, you know, good, good rates. Um, you know, we're happy if we're operating in that range. Uh, 670 to 739. This is still a good credit score and 670 happens to be kind of a cutoff for a lot of lenders with uh, certain things. So I, I think it's just fair that all of us have a goal at some point of, of trying to get our credit to that 670 or better level. Um, so, um, you know, that is good credit. And then as we move below that, we start to get in the fair and risky territory. So 580 to 669 is fair and 300 to 579 is considered risky. And this is all just, you know, third parties telling us what's risky and what's top notch and what's good. Um, but that is the world we live in, what we have to deal with. So I usually say, you know, that 670 and above is a, a good goal if you're not there yet. And then from there, it's always a good goal just to try to make it better. Um, you know, and it doesn't have to be uh, a certain number, just little baby steps to improve it over time. But how do we make our credit score better? Well, these are the factors that, uh, you know, make up a credit score. So the number one thing we can be doing to improve our credit score is pay bills on time and don't miss payments. So payment history makes up 35% of your score. Um, that's a that's a biggie. And by payment history, they just mean paying on time. So make sure bills are paid on time. Um, amount you owe is another big one, though. Uh, and that is actually the ratio of the amount you owe on your credit to 
the amount of credit that has been extended to you. So if you have a credit card that has a $10,000 limit and you owe 9,999 on it, your credit ratio is very high. You have 99% of your credit is, um, is being used. So you owe a really high ratio. You want that ratio to be lower. It's great when you have a $10,000 credit card and you owe nothing on it. That is what's going to improve that score. So improving the ratio of how much credit is out there for you to use versus how much you actually are using. And, you know, there's really, if you're trying to keep it simple with credit improvement, you might stop at just those two things. It's 65% of your score, you know, just pay on time and try to keep your balance as low as possible relative to what's extended to you. And that's, those are the two areas that are going to have the biggest impact. But three other areas that impact length of credit history. So the longer you have had credit open, the higher your score will go. For that reason, just a quick rule of thumb, never cancel your longest standing credit card. If you've got a credit card you had since high school, keep it open. You can cut that credit card up. Just monitor it through your online account to make sure that no one's got the number and spending money on it. Um, you know, set up automated alerts so that you would know if that happened. Um, you don't have to use the credit card, but actually having it open still benefits you because of the length of history, um, as well as that's more credit that's outstanding that you're not using. So um, new credit opened 10% as well as type of credit Um 10%. So new credit open just being any recent inquiries are going to ding your credit score um, downward uh, because they're starting to think, oh, this person is looking for credit and needs money. That's a negative indication for them. So you want to not open too many credit cards and those roll off every two years. Um, and then type of credit, there's really no hard and fast rule here. It's just have a mix um, so they like to see that you have consumer credit, like credit cards, home loan, auto loans, things of that nature. So it can be good to have a mix of different credits in your situation. Um, just some tips and tricks for, oh, someone have a question? Yeah. So I just was, has anybody else had this issue? I've had a credit card that I had open forever, but because I did not use it, there was no use It actually, they shut it down on me. Yeah, I have I've experienced that same thing because I actually have the example that I just gave a credit card from high school. <clears throat> I actually keep it open by every time they notify me, they're going to shut it down. I go buy a coffee on it and then I pay it off and they keep it open. Yeah. But that only works if they're sending you a letter ahead of time. letting. And I was yeah, I was just going to say, because I didn't get a letter <laughs> that I'm yeah. like, what? Yeah, that's a shame. So they shut it down and didn't give you an option to reopen it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I probably could have reopened it, but I mean, it was closed. And so I'm like, well, all right, it's closed, whatever. I don't need it. I'm not using it. Yeah. Yeah, that can happen. So, you know, you could, if it's your longest credit card and it's important to your score, you know, every couple of years, buy something on it. Um, most of them can be open for a really, really long time before that will start to occur. That's hard when you cut it up and get rid of it though. So you don't spend on it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, just wondering if anybody else had that experience. All right. So just some tips. Uh, um, one, open a card and build early. Time of having credit and making on-time payments and having credit extended to you all improve that score. The sooner you start building credit, the better. And if you don't have a credit score or you're in a position where you can't get a credit card, a traditional credit card, that's what they make secured cards for. So you can open a credit card with a secured card. It's kind of not a credit card at that stage because what they make you do is you need to give them the money that represents your balance limit up front. And then they're just letting you use that money that you've already given them. I know that seems like it stinks. And what's the point? The point of it is to start building a credit score so you can make baby steps and improving your financial foundations 
and be at a point later in life where you can have a solid credit score and benefit from that. So look for secured cards if you don't have credit or if you're having trouble opening credit. Um, Nerd Wallet, by the way, a great site where you can just like look at different cards and you can filter by secured cards and see what you can apply for. Um, automation, I'm big on that. If you get your first credit card, um, and if you're not in debt trouble already, you know, automate to pay your balance in full. The first thing you should do is set up an online account, set up automatic payments from your checking account to pay that balance off in full, not just the minimum payment. If you make just the minimum payment, that is going to start accruing interest. Interest on credit cards can be really high. So, um, you know, make sure you pay your balance in full. And if you automate it, you won't miss those payments. Um, Maximize reward dollars for your habit. So credit cards can also be a great tool for, you know, rewards. Um, they give you free money. You know, today there are cards that give you 2% cash back on every dime of spending that you do. Um, you know, wouldn't it be great to have 2% off on everything? If do you, you can... know, oh, do you sorry. know of any, sorry to interrupt you, but um, do you know of any good credit cards that do that? Like good for starting out that have good rewards? For starting out with, if you don't have a good credit score already? Well, I'm not saying my score is bad, but <laughs> yeah, I just right. don't have, I've never gotten a credit card before. So sure. Be like okay. A, Understood. a good one for rewards and cash back if you haven't had one before. Yeah. So you might have trouble without a credit card before to qualify for the ones with rewards. You might have to start with even a secured card or a card that doesn't have rewards to build credit over time and then get to a place where you can get good rewards. Most of the ones that have good rewards are cards that um, require that minimum 670 score, that good credit range that I talked about earlier. So you're going to need to try to get yourself built to that place first and then flip over to them. Um, but nerd wallet again, there, you can even kind of like filter by your credit score and they'll tell you, you know, here are cards with decent rewards in that range that we think you'll qualify for. So you could use that as a tool. I don't know of any off the top of my head, my two go-to credit cards, but again, really it should be about your habits, um, are there's a city double cash card from Citibank. It gives you 2% cash back on everything. I'm the kind of guy that thinks cash is king. 2% um, is a good rewards rate and it's on everything you spend. You don't have to kind of like manage, oh, it's only at gas stations or only at grocery stores or, you know, things like that. And remember what card to use. It's just nice. I know I get 2% cash back. So that's a great one. There's another card from American Express. This card actually does have an annual fee. So I give this out with, you know, just some warnings of, you know, good habits only, but uh, it's got a, I think it's a 70 or $90 annual fee, but it gives you 6% um, cash back at the grocery store, 6% cash back at the gas station, 3% cash back on all of your streaming services if you have streaming TV. So those are pretty core categories these days, groceries, gas, and streaming TV. A lot of people use them. So it, it takes a very short amount of time to make up that annual fee with the 6% cash back. So a lot of my clients use the 2% cash back for a lot of their spending, the city card and the Amex for groceries, gas, and streaming services, and it works pretty good. Those are some good goals to get to. Um, Sorry, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. So yeah, uh, your habits, though, I say, you know, th there are cards that give rewards for certain types of spending that are higher, that they give rewards in travel. If you feel like, you know, that'll motivate you to remember to spend correctly, um, you know, rewards are different for everybody. You can use sites like Nerd Wallet or uh, the Points Guy to kind of say, these are my habits, what my cards might work for me. But again, I'd look mostly for no fee credit cards and make sure that you can qualify with your credit score. 
Uh, then monitor your score. So most credit cards these days also have a credit monitoring app attached to it where um, it will periodically email you. What is your credit score? Did it get better? Did it detect new credit that was applied for? So it would alert you if somebody's applied for credit in your social security number. Um, you know, don't ignore your credit score. Watch it and set up alerts from your credit card company and take some, you know, time to celebrate that score getting better, even if it's just a little bit at a time. It's nice to see it tick up and it does take time to repair um, credit or build credit. Needs not wants with credit. So, you know, and this kind of goes along with the last one down there, know yourself. Um, if you can't use credit responsibly, if you just have spending habits that aren't healthy and you know you're going to look at that credit limit that's been extended to you as an excuse to spend more, rip them up, don't use it. Credits can have benefits, but it also has a lot of drawbacks. It's why credit card companies make a lot of money. Um, you know, make sure you're using it for the things that you need, not the things that you want and um, don't overspend. Uh, the second to last line here, uh, request line incre increases and make frequent payments. These are just some tips I have for credit building. If you already have cards or as you're growing, you know, your credit, um, when we talked about the ratio of credit that is on your cards versus what they've extended to you, a lot of companies allow you to request a credit line increase periodically. And some card companies don't actually hit your credit score to do that. Now, some companies do, like I think JP Morgan does, I think. Um, some companies don't. So you would want to call the card carrier first and say, if I request a line increase, are you going to check my credit again? If they say no, what a great way to improve your credit score without having your credit checked and also decreasing your credit score. It increases your line, increases the amount that's outstanding that you're not using. That can jack a credit score up a little bit right off the bat. So do your due diligence first, but request those line increases. And then make fre frequent payments. I said automate to pay your balance in full, but that happens monthly usually. Um, your credit score agencies might be checking what's outstanding on your credit card on a schedule other than your monthly end balance. So they might see that you have $5,000 on a credit card just because your automatic payment hasn't taken care of it yet. So sometimes I like people to set up like a weekly automatic bill pay from their bank to go to their credit card and just keep that balance low consistently so that your credit score remains higher when the credit agencies are looking at that balance. Um, you know, that can be a simple automation through bank bill pay. If you know you always spend $1,000 a month in your credit card, you know, send two fifty dollars a week over there. Don't even wait for the month then to have the balance paid in full just to have that as a backup. I've had the opposite happen. Well, I shouldn't say opposite happen, but um, I've gotten credit increase without even asking for it and they pulled my credit. Oh, that's a, that, that should be a no, no. I hope you can. Okay. All right. Okay, good. Cause I wasn't sure. I mean, I got more credit, which I really didn't want or need, but when I went and checked my credit report later on, it, I realized that they had pulled from my credit report or yeah. it was showing up on my credit report, I should say. Yeah. Yeah, that's not good. Um, and they sh shouldn't be able to pull a credit without a prior okay. authorization. Okay, and good. All right, that's good to know. In a case like that, I actually believe you should be contacting the creditor requesting that they pull that inquiry and take it off your credit report. Um, if Very good. Okay, good. That's good to know. I wasn't sure if that was allowed or not. So this is good. Thank you. Yeah. So then uh, let's talk a little bit about debt. You know, debt's kind of easy to um, accumulate and get into. We'll talk like how do we get out of debt if we're into it already. Um, so repayment strategies, uh, you know, what would we pay off first? So let's say we're um, you know, in a position where we have two loans, we've got a personal loan with $4,000 on it, 
a kind of lower 6.55% interest rate and a $50 minimum payment. And then we have another loan, a credit card, where we have $35,000 on it. And it has a 14.62% interest rate, a little bit higher, quite a bit higher, and a minimum payment of $450. If we got to a position where you had like $500 of extra cash flow to start paying down this debt, you know, which loan would we pay off first? Does anyone want to um, tell me what they would, how they would approach it, which loan they would want to start paying down first? So me personally, I would want to pay the lesser of just so I can get rid of it. But my husband and I actually had a conversation about this and he said that he would rather put it towards the one with the higher interest rate. Sure. So I'm not sure. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And before I even go to the next slide and show you the difference, um, my, what I encourage here is this is similar to, you know, a healthy habit section, you go with the method that works for you. Um, whatever motivates you to keep paying the debt down um, and not um, you know, get out of that habit. So here are the results. So option one, that is called the debt snowball. The debt snowball is when you pay off the smaller balance first. So in this case, it was the lower interest rate, lower balance card. Um, and then you get that paid off, you use that as kind of a motivational win, and you take the payment that was required over there, the $50 a month, and you roll it into the next biggest loan as you go. And when you do that, it's called Snowball. A guy named Dave Ramsey, who a lot of you have probably heard of before, um, swears by this method. It is all about the psychology of paying down debt that getting small wins is important to your personal finances and it doesn't matter what's you know kind of dollars and cents better for you it's about motivating you to take the action and getting small wins is big so that's called a snowball if you do that method that debt would be paid off in 55 months just a little under five years so option two where you attack the higher interest rate first um that is called the avalanche method, and that is always the method that involves paying the least amount of money if you can continue with it. Um, paying the higher interest rate first takes down your balance, reduces interest cost the fastest, means you pay the, the least. So if you did the avalanche method, you'd be paid off in 52 months under that same scenario. So it saves you three months of payments. And if you did the math, it was $1,000 of payments, the, the minimum payment of 500 between the two plus the 500 extra. So option two saved you $3,000 basically in uh, that scenario. So, you know, Tracy, there's no, there really is no right answer. Snowball method gets you out of debt. And a lot of people you use Dave Ramsey and they get out of debt, then it worked well. If the avalanche method can work for you and get you out of debt, it might be a little quicker and more efficient, but just picking a method and going with it that's going to work for you is important. Yeah, I'm not going to let him know that he might have been right. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> so then, you know, making a debt payoff plan, um, much like healthy habits, um, you know, first step is taking inventory. Don't ignore the fact that you have a lot of debt, um, it's stressful. It's, uh, you know, it can really bog you down. I know, you know, finances is one of the biggest sorts, sources of stress in the United States. But, um, you know, you can, you can do it. You can get out of debt. And step one is recognizing that you have it and writing it down and starting to build a plan. So track down everything you have um, and record, what do I owe? What's the minimum payment due on that debt? You know, what is its interest rate today? And then what's the due date of my monthly payment for that debt? And just make a little spreadsheet or chart of that. If you have trouble tracking down all of your debts, you can use your annual free credit report to do it. Um, your 
You can go to freecreditreport.com, pull a credit report. It will list all your debts and who your creditors are. And if you need to contact those creditors then to get access to your account or to get a statement, you can do that from there. Um, but just take an inventory. Step two, make a plan. So within make a plan, my first step is always, can I consolidate my high interest debt into lower interest debts before I start my pay down, right? Because if you can make your debt cost less, obviously you're going to get it paid off quicker. Ways you can get, you know, some consolidation of debt and they're not all easily available. Some of these are for better, uh, higher credit score um, situations, but home equity line of credit. If you do have a house that you've had for a long time, or sometimes even a short time in today's market, can you take out a consolidation line on your home to lower interest rates? If you have several credit cards in the high teens and 20s percent, and a home equity line can often be anywhere from 4 to 8%, that is one way you could consolidate debt get rid of the 17, 20% interest rates and make your kind of debt payoff journey a little bit quicker. Um, on credit cards specifically, 0% balance transfers can work just with the caveat of be careful. Um, one, to qualify for these, that is that 670 cutoff range again, where you need to have good credit usually to qualify for a 0% balance transfer credit card. So it might not even be available to everybody, but if you can do it, great. And be careful because remember, opening new credit cards impacts your credit score negatively. So you want to make sure that you're committed to this process and not just constantly opening 0% credit cards and balance transferring because eventually your credit score is going to drop so low and you can't do that anymore. So just be careful with that one. Usually kind of a one-time 0% transfer and getting that one paid down is the way to go. Um, you know, approaching a bank for consolidation loans, sometimes banks issue personal loans to consolidate credit card debt um, could be an option for this stuff. Um, I'll mention another resource in the last step too that could be um, resourceful, but, you know, do the, do the homework and look around, see where you can get a better rate. Um, so once you've consolidated debt, just commit to what is my extra fixed amount going to be? Um, you know, if you've uh, got a budget, is it going to be $10 a month, $100 a month, $200 a month? Just commit to something. It doesn't have to be huge, but something more than the minimum payments. Pick a strategy that works for you, either Snowball or Avalanche. We covered those. And then actually write down the payback schedule to motivate you. You know, take that list of each loan that you have, the minimum payment on each, what are you going to pay extra? Which one is the first one you're going to attack and create the payback schedule month by month. You can also Google amortization schedules and online they can create a payback schedule for you in 10 seconds. Um, so have something to motivate you. Um, finally, then you've got to just go set up the plan, right? You know, put it into action. And again, here, use automation. So first step is you've got to pay your minimum monthly payments. Even though one interest rate is higher than another, you still need to make the minimum payment on the low interest card. So set up automatic monthly payments for the minimum amount, make it happen, um, automatically. Then with the extra fixed amount that you've committed to, set that up automatically too. That might be you know, from your bank or from the credit card company where you say, take $100 every month and apply it to the principal that I owe and have it happen automatically. And then when that debt is paid off, you then add that payment, the total payment plus the extra you were putting to the next debt in line, according to the, either the snowball or avalanche payment method, whatever you selected at the start. Um, so, and then it's just kind of monitoring. Um, guess we, you know, like to encourage people to monitor it because it's going to keep you motivated. Celebrate that a credit card got paid off. 
um, be happy about small improvements to um, you know your debt picture and know that it's going to be a process, not an event. Um, hire a professional or engage family and friends as your accountability partner. You know, having somebody else that's there to keep you engaged with the process to be excited for you when you know uh, you get a credit card paid off is a huge thing. So don't be afraid to get somebody else engaged in your situation if you're having trouble managing it on your own. And then finally, just a resource here, moneymanagement.org. Uh, this is an organization that one time many years ago is government sponsored, isn't anymore, but um, they help people that are kind of in emergency situations that just can't get out of debt. Um, they force you to go through a budget with them as a part of getting started, which can't be a bad thing. And then they can actually go out to your creditors and they will negotiate either consolidation loans or lower interest rates on your behalf. And you will make one payment to them and then they will go pay off all your debts for you. They can, they've can they been a really good resource. I've had clients use them with some huge success. Um, it doesn't work for everybody. I always say, if you can manage your own debt payoff, start there first because money management does take a small fee. But money management, a lot of times, has negotiated interest rates lower, where even though there's a small fee, you're paying less on your debt than you were before you engaged them. So um, there are resources out there to help if you're just kind of perpetually in, in trouble with, with your debt. So good for managing a budget, good for lowering interest rates and having a debt payoff plan if you haven't done it yourself. Just my final kind of tips and tricks with debt. Um, you know, don't let credit cards become debt. If you're starting to build and you are going to go get your first credit card, set up those automatic monthly payments, pay it off in full. Just don't let it accrue. Those interest rates are so hard to get out of. Um, be aware, know how much you owe. Don't ignore it. Um, it's okay to be in credit card debt. Most people are. Um, be aware of how much it is and stay motivated to pay it off create your debt calendar and always pay on time. Automation, set up automatic payment payments. Uh, check that score annually or check your credit report annually as well. That's a good way to know if anyone's used your credit also and make sure your credit score is accurate. Um, and then just take baby steps and celebrate progress. I'm just realizing I'm at about 50 minutes. So I have a short investment section that I'm going to kind of motor through because I just want to leave time for questions if people have them. Um, so on investing, if you could leave here with one thing today about investing, start today. The earlier you start investing, um, the more compound interest works for you. That means that as your money grows, it grows faster. Compound interest is um, just a wonder of the world. Um, the earlier you start investing, your first dollar makes you the most amount of money. Start with something. There's no minimum amount to be an investor. Um, here's my example of starting early and how it can impact you. Uh, the top bar is you. Let's say you save from age 25 to 40, and then you never save again. The savings amount is at the bottom, $1,200 a year, and your investments earn a 6% growth rate. Your friend saves from age 35 to 65. So saves for 30 years, twice the amount of years that you save for, and then they stop. That means that you have put $18,000 into investments. Your friend has put $36,000 of their own money into investments. But when you're both age 65, you will have more money than your friend, even though they saved double the amount of money. You will have $127,000. Your friend will have $100. The earlier you start investing, the more dividends it pays. You just got to start as early as possible because of compound interest. You make most of your money in the later years. Um, be aggressive when you're young. You know, we've probably got different demographics on this call today, but, um, you know, stocks do very well over time. This is how $100 grows from 1971 over a 50 year period of time. $100 investment in stocks is $17,000 today. $100 in bonds, $3,000 today. 
hundred dollars just in cash and really short term vehicles, nine hundred dollars today, and something that cost a hundred dollars in nineteen seventy one just because of inflation costs six hundred and fifty five dollars today. So, um, yeah, when you're young, be aggressive. As you're getting older and you need your money, definitely that needs to be reevaluated. But, but you know, make sure your money is gonna work for you. Um, and don't panic along the way. This is just a chart of stocks since 1985. We've been through a lot of stuff that was scary and painful, just like the market that we're in today. And this isn't updated for today's inflation crisis. But, you know, we've been through Black Monday, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, dot-com bubbles, global financial crisis, Brexit, coronavirus, all of these things. Stock market is incredibly resilient the best thing you can be doing is just keeping your money invested over time and it will earn money for you. This is the S&P 500, which is stocks from 1985 to 2020. And that's the same index we used here over a 50 year in the of time. So just stick with it and don't panic. Um, and that's probably where I'm actually gonna cut it today um, and just kind of 